So, talking about yesterday I had the blues, how did Billy Holiday empower us so that today we can talk about having the blues in the past? Your album is a love letter to Billy and her legacy, and her legacy is really enormous. It is. You know, I mean, Billy, I think she talked about a lot of things that uh, needed to be said, you know, in her time. Uh, obviously, she talked about slavery and the effects of slavery, uh, lynching and racism in Strange Fruit. But she also talked about the sort of complex emotional terrain uh, that women navigate, you know, to this day, you know, falling in love with a man who is abusive, um, staying in abusive relationships, finding strength and finding yourself after an abusive relationship. And I think it's, for me, her music is just sort of a, a symbol of how to be a strong person in modern life, you know, how to navigate these new challenges that never existed before. So it's, it's really fascinating for me to interpret her music at this time. One of the most special things in the music of Billie Holiday is the way she transforms pain into art. Today you don't need to struggle that way to make beautiful music with emotional response. What is the way music touches people nowadays? Well, that's a good question. You know, I think um, struggle is kind of universal, right? It's like every generation has its own issues and problems. And I think music, both from the past and music that's being made now, has this role to sort of inspire and, um, and question, you know. So, you know, for example, right now in the U.S., a lot of music is being made around the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, artists like Robert Glasper and Kendrick Lamar and Thundercat. And that's really cool, you know, because I think it reflects the times we live in. But I'm happy to say that things in some ways have gotten better, you know what I mean, from Billie Holiday's time. Um, it's a complicated relationship between struggle and music. The atmosphere in your new album is simply amazing. I know that you wanted it to sound like you're in Bradley's, a special club in New York, which closed in the 80s. Could you tell us more about this place? Uh, well, I can tell you stories. You know, I never actually was there. That's what's funny about it. Um, because by the time I moved to New York, it was, it was gone. But, you know, I studied at the new school under the great jazz and blues pianist Junior Mance. And he was a, a fixture there. You know, him and George Coleman, the tennis sax player who played with Miles Davis, they were like fixtures at Bradley's, you know. And a whole generation of um, New York jazz musicians sort of came of age there because at about two, one or two in the morning, they would close the, the club and only let the musicians stay. And they would close the, the doors and it looked locked from the outside, you know, it looked closed. So the police wouldn't stop them, you know, and they would play, you know, sometimes till seven in the morning. And I'm fascinated by the kind of space that doesn't really exist anymore in New York, you know, where it's just a place where musicians go to play and, and learn from each other, you know, all night long. So I wanted it to have that quality where um, the musicians on my album weren't thinking about a label they weren't thinking about you know industry or jazz critics or or even the fact that it was a singer's album you know it was just the four of us in a room playing as we would if we were all alone and I, I always find that it's kind of difficult to achieve that but we definitely got that I would say it's sort of like if it's you and your lover alone in your bedroom you talk differently than if you were at the dining room table with your your parents. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's kind of, um, I wanted to capture that quality of, and let everybody kind of feel what that real jazz album would sound like, you know, because there were no arrangements. There was there was nothing sort of commercial about it in, in the industry way. You know what I mean? It was just real spontaneous jazz. 
what you just described about the atmosphere that you made uh, yesterday I had blues in it reminds me very much of uh, a previous album you had with Jeff Neff and um, when we spoke to him he as well as Nicola Conte another interviewee here on Jazz FM they both praised the intuitive way of you making music so how does music find its way out of your soul to the soul of your partner and of your listeners well you know that's a good question i think you know i don't know in a way and i enjoy not knowing you know like <laughs> i realized a point where um you know i was in school and i was sort of studying theory and i realized it's just not the way that i really love to understand music you know i understand that it's a language and it's important for certain musicians to play that way. But I also r realized most of the people who I love, and not just in jazz, in kind of every genre of music or the arts were mostly self-taught. Um, they had some form of education, but then they sort of figured it out on their own, you know, with hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of performing and playing You know, Billie Holiday was definitely one of those people. Um, the Beatles, um, Jimi Hendrix, you know, Kurt Cobain. So I think there's something to be said with just playing music and seeing what happens. You know, I think a lot of the classic rock albums were made that way. Definitely, you know, most of the classic jazz albums were made that way. You know, Kind of Blue is my sort of favorite. And nobody but Miles knew you know what was going to be played that day and maybe bill evans and um you know that's the the best jazz album in the history of the world so it's like i think that's the formula you know having great musicians but keeping it fresh you know otherwise it sounds too for me like it lacks the spontaneous emotional power in jazz music because it's very creative art form it is really important to be fearless and open-minded do you feel that way I do. I do. I think the only thing that at this time, because there's so much recorded music in jazz, I think the only thing you can really give that's worthwhile is honesty. Uh, when you talked about struggle some time ago, you meant struggling to make the world a better place. But sometimes this struggle is a struggle for survival. And very often the world today is scared of differences and you appreciate differences as bringing distinctiveness as uh, enriching the world uh, so how does that find expression in your music because it's really very different from the mainstream and it is so distinctive what kind of bravery is there here i don't know if it's bravery i think it's just it's the way i am you know i think um It comes from living overseas. You know, I lived in London for uh, about two years total and having to sort of negotiate a different lifestyle, a different way of thinking about myself, about the world. Uh, I was on a London label, you know, Brownswood with Giles Peterson for my first two albums. And I think I just stopped thinking so much like an American, honestly. I have friends all over the world, you know, in South Korea and in Japan and uh, obviously in Belgium. And not only friends, but I, I want to collaborate with artists, you know, and I find I'm most comfortable around a lot of different kind of people, you know, including in my band, you know. I play with people from all around the world. And, you know, I'm a, a true believer in the human spirit. And I think that music should mirror that that power you can't please everybody with your music because you make different music with every album do you have your own philosophy which helps you to take the criticism and not to be offended by that someone who does not like your music well you know i don't like every kind of music either <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> and so i think about it like myself like you know does it matter to any other artist if uh, I don't like their music and I think the answer is no you know like every expression I think if it's the true expression 
is valid. And um, I think that, you know, it's pretty clear to most people making music what people are going to like and how and why. You know, like, you hope people will understand it, but if they don't, it's like, well, they didn't get that one, you know. And I think I just have read and studied about too many classic artists like Bob Dylan or, or again, Miles, you know, or Coltrane, who was one of my idols. They had points in their careers where they weren't popular at all. And they struggled through that. And then they found acceptance and popularity. And then they pushed beyond that to really just become pure artists. And people didn't like it, you know. So it's it's sort of... Um, I think if you really want to be an artist, that's just part of the the struggle, you know. And I know that if I only made commercial music, that's a, a, a challenge in and of itself because your career is usually very short, you know. So it's if you want to dig in and, and really have a catalog of music, it's bound to be some stuff that people don't like. It's funny, actually, because I just saw the movie about Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys and watching scenes where he's making pet sounds and the band hates it and everyone hates it and it doesn't sell, you know, and then of course now it's regarded as one of the greatest albums of all time. So it's time is usually on the side of the artist. <laughs> Maybe when I'm dead, everyone will love all my stuff. <laughs> Very often people have an idea of how jazz musicians should sound and look, but the new generation of jazz musicians you're part of is totally different. What are the main differences between your generation and the generation of Ella Fitzgerald, Louis Armstrong, Billie Holiday? Well, so many things, you know, um, everything from the Internet to foreign policy. You know, I don't think that that generation could ever have truly imagined having a black president or a black first family, for example. We have representation, you know, in film and in, in uh, media, in fashion and modeling, um, of different different people from all around the world. I think we just truly live in a more global economy and society now. And it's just, there's more options now. So an artist like, you know, myself or Ambrose, I can run say, or, or Robert Glasper, we can sort of draw on a lot of different cultures because of the work that was done before us, you know, by the artist you mentioned, Louis Armstrong, Elle Fitzgerald, Billie Holiday. We can sort of choose the direction we want, you know, and I think if you have enough intelligence behind that choice, you can literally do anything. So it's an exciting time to be, to be a musician. I'm totally in love with your version of Al Green's song, Simply Beautiful. What do you find Simply Beautiful? Mm. Uh, funny enough, um, I actually really first heard Al Green in the Pulp Fiction movie, <laughs> and which is my favorite film. And uh, I went on to like try to hear all of his catalog I could. And to me, you know, I really love the songs that he wrote. You know, Love and Happiness, uh, Let's Stay Together, and Simply Beautiful, and something about that version because Al Green was also a jazz singer at the beginning of his career and I could really hear that kind of like intimacy in that place where where jazz meets soul you know and it just has stayed with me my my entire life and I decided because I would I would perform it all the time so I decided I should record it too and so I'm really happy I did and happy you like it <laughs> and finally, you are an encourager, both with uh, your music, but also using uh, the new social media. Uh, there was an amazing and very touching essay about human strength that you published uh, at the time of the release of Yesterday I Had the Blues, how to be brave in a world of uh, useless cruelty. Uh, then you had the dragon tattooed as a symbol of strength, and you often pose for pictures with the visa. Where do you believe our strength is? Well, I think everybody, you know, draws their strength from their past. You know, I think that's how we learn, you know, as society and as people in this linear fashion, you know, from birth to death in this, this cycle. And, you know, it's as simple in the beginning as like falling down and getting hurt and then trying not to fall down again, you know. 
falling in love and getting hurt and trying not to get hurt again, you know, um, bad business deal. And, you know, we learn by, by doing. And it, when you take all the sort of intellect away and uh, from humanity, we're still just mammals trying to, to eat and survive on this planet. So I think strength is inherited and I think it's learned. You know, I think we learned from the generations before us, like I'm learning from Billie Holiday, uh, who is definitely one of the strongest people I've ever heard about. And her generation who had to endure all kinds of criticism and racism and sexism um, for her to, to become one of the greatest artists in the history of the world is just a, a major, massive inspiration to me every day.